in the loop. I'm Christian Bryant. Hopefully you've been spending this MLK holiday really sitting with some of King's work and avoiding all the misused quotes that usually lack a bit of context floating around on social media. At any rate, here's what we got for y'all. On this Martin Luther King Day, we're taking a look at a part of Dr. King's dream for America that is more relevant than ever, the right to vote. So much of Dr. King's advocacy for civil rights tied back to voting rights. I'm thinking about his 1957 Give Us the Ballot speech, his work in organizing the 1965 Selma to Montgomery March, and his role in pushing for the 1965 Voting Rights Act. But now in 2022, voting options are narrowing and the voting process is getting tougher as many states put tighter restrictions in place and the burden for many of those changes is landing on voters of color. 35 states have some form of voter ID on the books. Those laws usually don't explicitly discriminate against voters of color, but do place a burden on lower income or more rural voters to take the time to get and or pay for an ID. Even if an ID is free, those people often lose out on hours or a day of work to get one. And given that the evidence shows that Americans of color tend to make less than white Americans and are less likely to already have the needed IDs, it adds another burden for voters of color. There used to be another layer of protection over some jurisdictions that prevented hurdles to voting, but the Supreme Court's 2013 ruling in Shelby County v. Holder eliminated that by gutting a key section of the Voting Rights Act, a law that Dr. King was instrumental in advocating for. And the removal of that protection led to the laws becoming more restrictive. That's according to USC Law Vice Dean Fernita Tolson, who has testified before Congress about voting rights issues and is an author of two upcoming books about voting and election law. A lot of states uh, have voter ID laws, but it's important to distinguish between types of voter ID laws, like to the extent that a state has a restrictive one. But what we saw in the wake of the Shelby County decision was states enacting more restrictive voter IDs, uh, voter ID laws, uh, because they don't have to pre-clear it with the federal government. Let's take a second and explain some of the provisions of that law that help protect voters of color. Section five of the Voting Rights Act required certain cities, counties, or states with a history of discrimination to obtain what's called pre-clearance. That is, those places would need federal approval before changing voting or election laws. That's the part the Supreme Court gutted. But recent challenges often center around section two of the law. That bans any voting practice or procedure that discriminates based on race, color, or language. A later amendment made it so that it could be enforced regardless of whether the laws were intended to discriminate. But a Supreme Court case last year on Arizona's voting laws raised the threshold that a new law would have to meet to be considered a violation of Section 2. The Supreme Court was looking at changes to Arizona's election law, and they were specifically looking at changes that seemed to negatively impact Black voters, Hispanic voters, and Native American voters. The Supreme Court said, no, there's actually no problem here. Uh, and the state can justify the changes that they made, which are more restrictive on voting rights, if the state says that they are worried about voter fraud. Chara Torres Spellacy is a visiting professor at American University and an expert in election and voting law. She says this decision can make it easier for states to justify voting law changes without even showing evidence of fraud. It is a enormous boon to state lawmakers that the Supreme Court is now being so permissive and is giving such deference to the states when they enact new laws, especially when they enact restrictive voting laws. Even with these federal laws, a central issue here is that elections are administered entirely by state and local officials. And aside from core laws like the Voting Rights Act, most other questions around elections like voter ID, early voting times, absentee ballot policies are all decided on a state-by-state -state basis. Now, there are policy solutions pending in Congress that could address some of the problems cropping up in the current setup. Democrats have centered their push around two bills. The John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act is a bill that's been bubbling among Democrats since 2019. It would restore a pre-clearance requirement for voting law changes similar to the old Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act and give the law more avenues to survive lawsuits and make it easier to challenge voting or election laws 
for discrimination. That bill failed when it was brought up for a vote in November. Democrats voted for it along with one Republican, but it didn't overcome a filibuster that required 60 votes for the law to pass. The second bill, the Freedom to Vote Act, was introduced this fall as a compromise after some wariness about the initial bill from moderate Democratic Senator Joe Manchin of West Virginia. It would require expanded early and absentee voting, make election day a federal holiday, enable automatic registration for voters, and also deal with other election issues, including a ban on partisan gerrymandering and new protections against partisan interference in the work election officials do. Last week in early January, the House passed a consolidated piece of legislation that combines these two bills. The provisions of the Freedom to Vote Act that are that are now a part of this mega bill are also important for everyday voters. If it passes, um, it's a, a completely new day for American democracy. It, that bill would be um, the most important voting bill since the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Democrats by and large support these laws, but Republicans are nearly unanimous in opposing them. And because the filibuster makes it so easy for any senator to voice a 60 vote threshold to pass a bill, and because some Democrats oppose getting rid of the filibuster, these bills are heading nowhere fast. It's led to a lot of pushback from voting rights advocates who want to see Democrats eliminate the filibuster, if not for all bills, then at least for these federal voting laws. Speaking in Georgia in early January, President Biden endorsed working around the filibuster to pass these bills, but at least one Democrat, Senator Kirsten Sinema of Arizona, objected to the approach. A coalition of voting rights groups in Georgia told President Biden to scrap the trip he took to the state last week unless he revealed a more concrete plan to immediately pass stronger federal voting laws. But some groups still didn't think Biden went far enough. And now members of Dr. King's family have spoken out. Martin Luther King III and other members of the King family are spending the long weekend marching in both Arizona and Washington, D.C. with a coalition of groups to pressure Congress to act on voting rights. But even as the fight about federal voting rights continues in Washington and states pass tougher voting laws, many communities of color and voter advocates are using the Voting Rights Act to fight back. And it's worth noting that the effects of Dr. King's advocacy don't just apply to black voters. Other communities have used provisions of the Voting Rights Act to protect their rights too. Newsy correspondent Allison Herrera shows us how indigenous and Native American tribes have leveraged the legal protections created during the civil rights era to defend their right to vote. The history of voting for Native Americans is complicated. Native people weren't citizens of the United States until 1924, but it wasn't until 1948 that Indigenous people got the right to vote. And some couldn't access the ballot box until 1962. That's because some states didn't want Native people participating in general elections. Despite recent gains and the high turnout of Native voting in recent elections, many say barriers still exist to casting a ballot, like when Montana passed two laws to end same-day voting registration and ballot collection. What I would just like people to know is that, you know, we always think of the long lines in Georgia and in Texas, but... This is what voter suppression looks like in Indian country. It's an intentional and clear cut exploitation of the current vulnerabilities that the community faces. That's Samantha Kelty, a staff attorney for the Native American Rights Fund. They've recently filed an injunction in the state of Montana to prevent two laws from taking effect, House Bill 176, which would end same-day registration, and House Bill 530, which would end organized ballot collection in rural parts of the state where many tribal citizens reside. Kelty says allowing same-day registration and ballot collection are key for Indigenous people in Montana if they want to be able to vote. Rural tribal communities across the seven reservations in Montana depend on election day registration and ballot collection to participate in elections. Um, election, day registration, election day registration allows Native Americans to register and vote in just one trip to a polling center. During the 2020 election, Indigenous voters were key to Joe Biden winning counties in Arizona, Wisconsin, and Minnesota. Although they represent a smaller portion of the electorate, Indigenous voters can wield a lot of power. Organizers across the country drove hours, sometimes going house to house, to make sure voters on reservations were registered to vote in what was one of the most notable elections in recent history. The Native American Rights Fund 
Fund says across the board, there are still many barriers to voting. They released a report in 2020 that drew on hundreds of interviews from citizens of tribal nations across the country. So what we're looking at now is the Freedom to Vote John R. Lewis Act. So they've been merged together. The For the People Act is the one that expands and protects voting rights. And I think that excitement from the 2020 election is continuing. You know, the native turnout was huge and made a difference and people saw that. And I think that's that empowerment is is uh, it's shining. It's high. The psych is high. So I hope that uh, we, we see a big turnout for um, the midterm elections as well.